Master Tavern Keeper's History of the Old World. So, at last, Marco Colombo and the other survivors are on their way back to the old world. But it doesn't seem like it was an uh, uneventful journey. Yeah, yeah, you hit the nail on the head there, Master Tavern Keeper. The Pintolaga left the harbour on the tiny island of Tonda mid-afternoon. The monsoon winds had indeed changed direction, facilitating the boat's uh, smooth departure from the uh, murderous hands of the lizardmen. But uh, the rains still poured from the skies unabated, pelting the ship with a roaring mist of warm water. Whilst the boat had been uh, dry docked for repairs, my grandpapa had made a point of waterproofing the... Uh, upper hatches, and after a suggestion from Marco, constructed something called uh, crochet bars on the boat. I think they are some kind of a uh, roof. Master Tavern Keeper, you've spent uh, some time in La Chique. Can you tell us about these? Ah, yes. Crochet bars. I know of them. They are uh, simple roofs set upon vertical wooden beams that dot the city of La Chique. They were originally made as shelters from the burning sun for the more elderly residents of the city as they uh, move from one place to another. But to be honest, they are mostly used by the uh, pleasure seekers of the uh, metropolis for small social gatherings and the like. The same gatherings that all too often get well out of hand, resulting in far too much frivolity and far too much um, spillage, if you uh, know what I mean. Ah, yeah, yeah. I think I know what you mean. Vink, vink, nudge, nudge. Say no more. Well, on the ship, they provided cover from the uh, monsoon rains for the sailors and helped the excess of water to uh, run off directly into the sea without uh, seeping into the lower decks. My grandpapa had uh, used the large jungle leaves found in the canopy of the swamps of Tonda to cover each roof, so they were quite lightweight as well. So we saw the boat battled through the worst of the rainstorms for the rest of the afternoon as they worked their way along the coast before heading out towards the treacherous expanse of the great ocean. As dusk approached, the boat neared open waters. The heavy rain slowly petered out to a light drizzle before stopping completely. This was no piece of good look, though, for it was immediately replaced by a thick, rolling fog that enveloped the boat in its dank embrace. But this was no normal miasma, an unnatural, odious smell. Something like uh, salty cadavers, my grandpapa described it as, clung to its wispy tendrils, and many sailors swore that they saw ethereal dead faces appear and then disappear back into the depths of the fog. This obviously put everyone on edge. I do not like this. Give me a storm and a rain over this affected blindness. My grandpapa began to nod before suddenly bringing his finger to his lips. He could hear something. The two strained their ears and listened. The sound my grandpapa had heard came again. A dolorous sound that weaved its way through the fog bank and silenced the rest of the crew. What is 
that. At this, the ship's quartermaster, a man nicknamed Zenzero, stepped forward. Those are the bells of the decaying hulks of the zombie pilots of the vampire coast. The thralls of the blind maid and the lord of the abyss. They took my brother's ship, and now they have a come for me. We are doomed. Ha! Huh. I have not escaped the clutches of the sacrifice-obsessed skinks to fall into the hands of some stinking undead. Their ghostly ships hide in the fog are ready to pounce, and they are accompanied by a siren wail that leaves the sailors paralyzed by confusion and the easy prey for the zombie pirates. I say it again, we are doomed, we are doomed, I say doomed, doomed. Bosun, restrain Zenzero, he has a gone a ma- Marco suddenly stopped, recalling the death throes of the bosun in the bloody jaws of the chaotic Ulfina, Vegir, the sacrificer. Guilty, anger, perhaps, made something snap in Marco. He suddenly rolled up his sleeves and went for the quartermaster. Never mind, I will do it myself. Marco punched the babbling quartermaster in the jaw and attempted to grapple him to the deck. My grandpapa was taken aback, but uh, he too felt raw emotions bubbling to the surface. He was about to move to join in the fight when uh, something Zenzero had said caused him to stop. He strained his ears once more. The bells of the unsaid uh, fleet were closer, but uh, behind that sound he could hear something else. A piercing note, barely audible, but uh, still there. He stopped his ears and suddenly a sense of control reasserted itself. But, as he looked around, the crew was devolving into a crazed mob, attacking each other without rhyme nor reason. Suddenly, an idea flashed across my grandpapa's mind, and he ran into Marco's quarters. He returned, bearing as many beeswax candles as he could fit into his large pockets, while still keeping his fingers in his ears. The rest of the crew on the upper deck were now veying into each other with wild abandon, madness in their eyes. Marco and Zenzero too had the very same look, with the latter still muttering doom whilst Marco muttered the boatswain's name, Gio, over and over and over. My grandpapa darted below decks to the ship's kitchen. Here there were a pair of brick fireboxes, and upon each stood a large copper cauldron. The ship's cook, a man they called Brandivine, stood over the nearest cauldron, manically stirring the pot of boiling water with a bronze ladle, whilst humming a tuneless ditty. Upon my grandpapa entering, the cook slowly turned to face him. A terrible grin splitting his face and his eyes rolled back into his skull. My grandpapa grabbed the nearest iron pan and smashed the man across the face, sending him spinning to the floor and knocking him senseless. He collapsed onto the pile of firewood beside the firebox and remained still. But, as soon as my grandpapa had removed his fingers from his ears, the piercing sound once more tore at his senses, and he felt a creeping sense of anger. The urge to destroy anything that got between him and the cloying sound. He resisted with every fibre of his resolve, and threw the candles into the boiling water before covering his ears once more. The beeswax candles soon became soft and malleable. He pulled one out by its wick and pinched off a palm-sized chunk, divided it in two, and then shoved each part into his ears. 
This blocked out the silent veil that was trying to claw its way into his psyche. Ah, just like in the old uh, Jack of the Sea story. What a bright man your grandfather was. Ah, why thank you, Master Tavern Keeper. So we saw he then filled a large redware pot with hot water from the cauldron and threw in the balls of beeswax. He then attached a pair of leather straps to it, stopped at the top and hefted it up over his shoulder. He then went to the gunnery deck. Here he found the gunnery sergeant, a man named Heinz, and his men, all of whom were seemingly unaffected by the uh, siren's veil. Oh, how could that be? Ah, of course. If he was anything like every gunnery sergeant I've ever known, he was probably half deaf. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so my grandpapa explained what was going on on deck to Heinz, who was an uh, excellent lip reader, I ought to add. And the uh, sergeant assigned a pair of men to aid my grandpapa in his task. My grandpapa also warned Heinz that an undead fleet was no doubt bearing down on them and to prepare the cannons to fire at his own discretion. My grandpapa and the two sailors then made their way up to the upper deck. Many sailors were still fighting each other, whilst others lay still upon the deck boards, their skulls smashed in. Behind the brawling men, my grandpapa saw the silhouettes of rotting ships begin to emerge from the fog. He could make out Norse longships, a galleon from Bretonia, an Arabian dhow, a Tylean merchant's vessel, perhaps that of Zenzero's brother, he thought, and various ships from the navy of the Empire. They were surrounded. Suddenly, below the deck, the cannons of the Pintalaga flared into action. Cannon fire lit up the wall of fog and the hull of the nearest rotting hulk. An imperial wolf ship cracked and crumpled as cannonballs tore through its rotten timber with wet, brittle, snapping thwacks and immediately caused seawater to flood into its interior. The boat rolled onto its side and began to sink, but not before its main mast had crashed into the adjacent Norse longship and become entangled. The sinking Imperial boat then dragged the longship down into the depths as it disappeared from view. With a certain amount of satisfaction, my grandpapa made out ranks of zombies standing impassively on the two boats as they were swallowed up by the thirsting ocean before shifting his gaze back to the fighting on his own ship. In the morass of men, he saw Zenziro. He was attempting to throw the unconscious body of Marco over the side of the boat. My grandpapa pointed at the quartermaster, and then he and the two sailors accompanying him raced across the deck towards Marco, dodging the frothing combatants as they did so. The two sailors each grabbed Zenzilo by one of his arms and dragged him away from Marco as my grandpapa pulled his friend from the edge of the boat. Just as he was about to tumble into the depths of the sea, I might add. My grandpapa then took out a pair of balls of warm beeswax and shoved them into the ears of the quartermaster. He struggled for a moment until suddenly clarity returned to the man's eyes. Another barrage of cannon fire erupted from below and another hulk was crippled and sank. The next few minutes continued in the same fashion. My grandpapa and his growing entourage of ear-plugged sailors wrestling the others to the deck and blocking up their ear holes with beeswax. 
whilst Heinz directed his gunners in disabling the slowly creeping armada of zombie pilots with extreme prejudice. Finally, with the last of the crew overcome and their ears plugged with beeswax, my grandpapa stood to evaluate the situation. Up above, he could see stars twinkling. The fog was dissipating. The remaining undead hulks still floated on the waters, but were no longer moving to engage the Tylians. My grandpapa, in light of all this, gave orders to the men. Admittedly, this involved uh, quite a lot of uh, gesturing, as you can imagine. Firstly, the ship's muskets and handguns were broken out and distributed to each of the able-bodied seamen. He then had the two gunnery men take the unconscious Marco back to his cabin before returning to help Heinz reload the cannons. But he also requested that Heinz wait for the order before firing again. Cautiously, my grandpapa then pulled one of the beeswax earplugs out. The silence veil was gone. He pulled out the other earplug and everyone followed suit. He then noticed in the distance a larger ship seemed to be approaching and the other rotting hulks began to part to allow it passage. Perhaps my grandpapa should have ordered Heinz to shoot then and there, but uh, something stopped my grandpapa. Curiosity, perhaps. Perhaps something darker. But uh, whatever the reason, he allowed the boat to approach. <laughs> <laughs> 